Hello and welcome to our crunchy Euros section of our Shucks preview video series. This series of videos is taking you through a bunch of up and coming new releases that we're rather excited about. But remember, these are previews, not reviews. They are separate from our editorial content. No opinions in these, just looking at a bunch of upcoming exciting games. Without further ado, let's have a look at some crunchy Euros. Tom, what's your favorite thing about being lost and dancing in the forest? Meeting all the witches along the way. That's right, it's Septima, a game about running a coven of witches. You've got a head witch, you've got an assistant witch, and you've got two more spaces for even more witches. You know what you're going to be doing in this game? You're going to be trying to help a town that doesn't really like you mm. yet. Because over the course of the game, you're going to be helping... Up until the end, it sounded a lot like my childhood. <laughs> Just like your childhood in that throughout the course of the game, being your childhood, you helped out the village by healing all of their illnesses. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Did they appreciate me? No. And did they I was from the south of England. <laughs> and did they send witches, witch hunters after you? Yes. yes. So generally, throughout the course of this game, you're going to be trying to heal this ailing village. You're going to be playing cards in your hand to do that. You're going to be moving your witch around the board. Mm -hmm. And you are going to be avoiding these witch hunters who are out to get you. And also, a lovely little thing that you're going to be doing throughout the game is resolving trials. Over here, oh, okay. you'll see you have characters who are being put on trial for being a bad witch. And you're going to try and rescue them and add them into your coven. And you might even need to rescue your own witches if they get caught by witch hunters. Mm. So It do be like that sometimes. <laughs> it do be like that sometimes. We're going to play over four seasons. And each season is going to contain five rounds. You can see with this little lunar tracker over here. And what you do on any given round is shown by this little kind of segmenty thing over here that looks really complicated, but really it's quite simple. It's just the triangle of power. The triangle its way of power. Through the universe. The core of Septima is going to be playing these cards. You've got a big hand of them. They're just there on your little Thank player you, board. Thomas. And each one of these cards is going to give you access to a certain action. So, for example, a move card might let you move around the map, or a right card might interrupt with the advanced module that I've added onto the side of the oh, board over here. Oh, I did notice. Oh, <laughs> we'll talk about I that in a bit. It, but look at your advanced module, Mr. Brewster. It's very colourful. Throughout the course of the game, you're going to be m moving things around that advanced module. We'll get to that in a bit. But the core is making potions and giving them to the villagers to try and help out the cause of getting witches into the public eye. <laughs> that sounds like a PR campaign. You're saying that the band The Cause were witches? Huh? Are you saying that the band The Cause were witches? Because that was kind of... Was no, that was bewitched. Right. These are all musical references yeah. that do not matter. Never mind. Every turn you're going to be playing a card to take its action. So let's say I play a move, I can move around the forest. But there's a really lovely little twist here where if you match the other player's action, you get to do a little bonus. So for the move, you get to move and then also collect some ingredients. But the problem with that is that... If multiple witches do the same action on any given turn, that will arouse the suspicion of the witch hunters. Yeah. Typical. Uh, when that happens, you're going to roll this witch hunter dice and you're going to add it to your current suspicion level and see whether the witch hunter can see you. And if they do, this is really quite neat, they will take your lead witch and put them up on trial for witch hunting. We'll talk about how you get them back later on, um, but there's a whole... I just think that's a cool little mechanic. It's yeah. like your your main sort of socketed player character just gets pinched away from you. Yeah. Lovely stuff. And put on trial and for, put being on witch, trial for being a witch, which arguably they are. Yeah, that's true. Guilty. Uh, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Outside of moving, you might also want to collect ingredients, which you can see here. We've got these lovely little things. So we've got these little fancy blueberries. We've got these weird little trode stools. Bloop, bloop. These lovely ingredients. I've got to say the components here are gorgeous. They are lush. I'm particularly enjoying the fact that one of the seasonal sections, as represented by this token, is a little carrot. <laughs> and we've got them here. There they are. Little carrots. I think we are using some deluxe components uh, here. That wouldn't That's surprise me. To note. That wouldn't surprise got me. These incredibly hefty coins that are really quite lovely. Frightening. So you're going to be collecting these things from the spaces that you are in and the ones around them. And you also collect lunar ingredients, which is mm -hmm. kind of what's in season this month. Yeah. Um, another card. It's wonky carrots. Mm hmm. Another card such as Brew will let you then brew potions, which you can then take from this supply here. And the potions are what you're going to use to heal up the patients, which you can see in the middle of the main board. Healing patients is going to increase your mastery of that specific kind of injury, head, foot or hand. 
And then it will also, at the end of the round, the more of these unhealed patients there are, the more hostile villagers will turn up at the trial to be like, they've done nothing. Uh, they've brought curses upon our nice... Which witch has done any good healing on, on me and exactly. my weird feet. Selfish. I don't think we should be accepting their weird carrots. So we've got all these little people here that are going to sort of queue up to then go and visit this trial at the end. But one of the actions you can do, called Recruit, will let you put your own little loyal servants in here. Classic. Who are going to be nice little villagers that are going to help you Coughing out when you get the back of the jury and going, I don't know, folks, these, these witches <laughs> seem pretty innocent to me. This trial happens at the end of a season, uh, and that's when you're going to try and claim some of these people to join your coven. So if you have a sort of majority of loyal people, then whoop, they come and they join your coven and they give you more of their fancy little abilities, which mm. is rather cool. Mm. We also have over here this big right track board, which is one of the advanced modules. You can play with this or you can not, where you get charms, which are one-off abilities you can fire off. And by matching actions with other players, you'll go up this thing and get crystals, which can be used as wild ingredients for potions. So much going on. Mm. Loads of lovely little systems but to put you use yourself at risk. They do put you at risk. More. Witch trial. Witch trial. Witch trials. Let's burn a witch. I like witch trials. Let's burn a witch. Yeah. That's, the, that's the theme tune for the witch trials. I like how in the manual it sort of made it sound like, you know, the witch trials are going to be a little bit of the game. You're like, oh, there's witch hunters around. But they seem quite central. They seem like a sort of pervading force that you're always going to have to avoid as you also try and play a little Euro game on top uh, of it. Yeah, a little Euro make... game with potions. And what <laughs> a gorgeous thing this is. It's beautiful. Oh, God, I ate too many peanuts. He ate some peanuts that he was handled <laughs> by a witch. So let that be a lesson to everyone at home. I can't be healed. Don't <clears throat> trust. Nuts. Nuts. Uh, um, Septima, thank you very much uh, for watching. Yeah, sorry that I um, had a bit too much <clears throat> nut in sorry, my mouth. you're not dead. Next video. Hello and welcome to Hamlet, a game that has absolutely nothing to do with a procrastinating Danish prince. Hamlet is actually the English word that is mostly used for a village that doesn't have a church. And so the aim of this game is to stop your hamlet being a hamlet by building a church. This little paper craft church only comes with the Founders Edition. It's worth noting that some of the fancy bits here are just for the Founders Edition and not the Standard Edition. So do be careful before you're buying that you know which version you're getting and exactly what pieces are in it. The aim of the game is to build this church and you're going to do that by making a number of deliveries to it. Now the really interesting thing about this game is that everything that's in the board, apart from your donkeys and your player tokens, belong to everybody. You will later on be able to get scoring tiles that you can put a little flag on and say, yep, that's mine. But for the most part, you are just building stuff that other people will be able to use. It creates quite an interesting dynamic throughout the game. Now at core, all of the buildings that you are building are sort of worker placement places. Your villagers can move along any of the roads on the board to get to any place they want to take an action. However, the distance does really matter here. It's still a geographical thing. Whenever you take an action that requires resources, unless it's the gold that you have privately at home, then that means you will need to be moving resources from other tiles. Now, each resource will could move one space, but if you need to get it further than one space away, you need to get a donk. The donkeys act like a sort of bucket chain, able to like ferry stuff as far as you want, provided it's just going one donk, gets it one extra tile, and then you donkey, 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 and then you use it at the end. You can't transport things you aren't going to use immediately. So you can't use this to mess up with other people's plans, but you do have to always be thinking about what routes are gonna be available on the board and what's gonna be ready when. Everything you do has the potential to help other people. You start off with a set of production spaces and each one of them will get you money but leave a load of resources on the table. Now you might just want to get the money and not really care about that but if you're providing the stone that someone else needs to make bricks to turn those bricks into something even fancier you might be leaving points on the table. But importantly the whole game will be building up as you go. One of the actions in the town hall lets you get new workers and new donkeys, but it also, more importantly, grabs you some of these blueprints. There's a little market down here that will slowly be refilled from this bag, allowing you to build fancier things. The landmarks will encourage you to build in unusual ways. This pond wants to have a path to it, even though that path will not be useful because the path 
the pond doesn't need resources. The refinery spaces are where a lot of the game is. And if you're the fun to build one of these, you'll be known around the land for making the best planks of wood if you build a sawmill. But also, it'll introduce an entire other stack of tiles into the game. The other interesting thing about the refineries is that the things that are produced there won't get you points immediately. They get you a point and a coin or two if you're the person that built that refinery and so you are the one who makes the best. But you only get points from them when they are used. So you've either got to come up with convoluted ways to place your workers and your donkey so that you can activate lots of things at once, or you've got to know what other people are doing and hope that them doing that will benefit you more than them. The placement rules are fairly straightforward. You can actually place them wherever as long as roads are going to roads. However, you can't build the little bridgy path roads that is one of the actions that you can take on your turn over cliffs, which is where some rock meets some woods. Now you'll notice that all of these tiles are quite unusual shapes. Everything's built on a much smaller triangle than any tile in the game, meaning that everything fits together neatly but you've also got to do some thinking about exactly where you're going to want to put things. It means that each village will actually be unique. The end of the manual encourages you to take a photo and put it on social media, which I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. But I do really like that it feels like you've built a little village at the end of it. When you start off the game, you do not know what is going to be available and you've got to make choices based on building a shared town with your own objectives and your own selfishness. I, I really... <laughs> I live in a small town and I am slowly being taught bits of the history of it and there is something about the fact that um, certainly British towns, small towns, villages, end up joggledy-boggledy in a way that most like steady hexagonal tire laying games don't really cover. I think it's very cute that you can passive aggressively build your sawmill on the wrong side of town, especially knowing that you're going to have to pay the price of that passive aggression later. And that's Hamlet, the village simulator with donkeys and passive aggression. Yeah? Sounds all right. Bye! Up next, we have a prototype copy of Tabriz from Randy Flynn, who you might know as the creator of Cascadia. I think mm. that might have won Spiel des Jahres. I think it was definitely several people, I think, on Cascadia. That's very true. But yes. it's, yeah, but he was one of the creators it. of Cascadia. Mm. And I think I'm going to put a big citation needed if it won Spiel des Jahres. It might have done. Who's to say? The internet will put a big the clarification. The important thing here. is it had salmon in it. And this, it as did. far as I can tell, doesn't, but that's fine. Yeah, no salmon in this one. But you know what it has got? Carpets. Mm. Lots of nice little carpets. In this game, you and your friends are going to take the role of merchants who are making carpets in the city of Tabriz. You have your little merchants here, and this is a big market board. You're going to be going around visiting these little stalls to buy ingredients, to buy dyes, to buy wool, to buy fabric, to then put in your little shop and make into commissions, which are going to sell for some money and some prestige and some mm. skill. Your skill as a carpet maker is going to make you be able to take on more complicated commissions from right. the nobility. So you're proving your worth as a carpeteer. You are indeed in the city of Tabriz. So what you're going to be doing during this game is a pretty simple process. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to choose one of your merchants and you're going to move them up to three spaces to a little market. Okay, okay. So I'm going to go one, two, three. Go to this little market over here. I want to make some green carpets, so I'm presumably going to buy some green dye. You are indeed. Here, right? You can buy one green dye for two bucks, two green dye for four, and so on and so forth. So you could take some of that dye and you could put it in your little board. What mm. would you use that dye for later on? You might use it in creating this lovely carpet, which oh, needs gosh. a whole smorgasbord of different dyes. Or maybe this carpet, which needs oh. absolutely loads of green dye. My word. 
Now, the core of this game is the fact that you have loads of different market tiles. In fact, we can't even see the whole board. It extends all the way over here. It just keeps going forever and ever. It doesn't go that far. It goes that's quite just, far. That's though. just silly. It's long. But it does go quite far. It is a long board full of all these different market tiles, which all have different rates for certain different things. You have split shops that have a bit of column A, bit of column B. You've got trades where you can swap die for other die. You've also got these shops that involve placing and rolling dice these big sort of handfuls of dice over here that have mm -hmm, all kinds mm -hmm. of different ingredients on them um and there's an interesting little thing which i sort of realized that like not many of these places get you money so it might be quite tricky to like buy a load of die and then swap it somewhere else and you might have to do these quite creative calculations with how you're gonna do you not, finish your commission do you not make money by selling carpets that's gonna be your primary way of making money i was gonna say if you're a carpet creator <laughs> yeah and you're not making money from selling carpets you're doing it for the love just maybe like you're making youtube videos about carpets yeah. or something i don't know that'd be crazy Obviously, most of your money is going to come from actually selling these carpets at the end of the round, where you can sort of cash in your commissions at the end of a turn. But to keep yourself afloat in between, you might need to sell some die here, sell some die here, do some other bits. But you're also going to gain skill for making these carpets, which is going to let you take on harder commissions, let your merchants do more movement, and maybe get you some prestige right at the end. You can also pick up commissions from the center and a little bit of money if you want to just have a little bit of extra cash to go and buy some dye, or you can take a load of commissions and just choose one. So you can either choose to have money to try and help you out whatever you might have, or if you're very good at getting one specific kind of dye, or you can see what you're gonna have. Mm. You're savvy, you could get the perfect commission that means you can use it up straight away. Also at the end of the round, you're gonna add in some more stock into the individual places so that you can then go and buy more stuff, but if they overfill, you're gonna empty the whole thing. Oh gosh. Yep, so you're gonna have to try and scoop up those bargains. The green dye's gone bad. Oh. And we have to throw it all in the bin. At the start of every round, we also have what's called a workshop phase, where we sort of do some admin upkeep. But really, it's quite simple. Moving around this big market, buying up a bunch of goods and turning them into some sweet, sweet yeah. carpets. So I'd basically be filling up my little, uh, my little die board with all the different types of dyes. Mm -hmm. Well, not all of them, but some of them. Some of them. And then trying to work out how the heck to turn it into a carpet. Yeah, exactly. For money. That would be crazy. These carpets don't roll up though, do they? You I, can try. I think like if Please I try don't try. these carpets, <laughs> I feel like they're not. Very attractive little rugs though. Very attractive. They are, they're rugs. lovely. I feel like that is, that's gonna be a, a final asset. Obviously a lot of the pieces you can see yeah, here. Yeah, this is prototype stuff, obviously. It's prototype. Then, of course, these will overlay into your game of Calico. They will, yep, <laughs> exactly. Yep, yeah, you can put your cats on there, and then you can bring that into Cascadia Town, yeah. I guess. And then the, the salmon will be wrapped up in the carpets. Mm, Delicious. Like a tasty burrito. Mm, the crunchy, scaly fun. That's Tavriz, a game about making carpets from Randy Flynn and Crafty Games, coming soon. Ooh. Yeah, my favourite time. Live and let die, carpets. Die that on this episode of Shuck's Previews, we're going to space mm. in Galileo Project, where we're going to live on the moon of a different planet. I can't remember which planet. Galileo. Mm. Gary planet. What's the one? Ganymede Europa, Europa. is the moon of Jupiter? Germany? We've got all the four moons of whatever planet we're talking about, and we're going to go and visit them, we're going to develop them, we're going to have a good time on them with our friends that we meet in a casino. There's a space casino in this game. I read the sort of like, the, the vibes of what's going on here, mm -hmm. and it's cool. Mm. In the future space, everyone hangs out at the casino and uses robots to do what they want to do, and cryptocurrency, I think. Well, you can't have everything. Yeah. So in this game, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing just three nice and simple actions. This actually... <laughs> casino. <laughs> casino. Robot. <laughs> robot. I mean, that's almost there. Casino, robot, and technology. Nice. The so three board games. To give some biographical detail for this game, this is from Sorry We Are French, and they have made a few different games that have this art style, and they are all quite... This is going to sound really like I'm... I'm it's like they've slipped me like a tenor under the table to say this. They're big experiences in small amounts of time. Mm. There's three steps on your turn, and there's three actions for the middle bit in this turn sandwich. The first thing you can do is you can choose if you want to be on your current influence track or the other influence track. Influence is one of the currencies that you're going to use. You're going to spend it on a bunch of different stuff in this game. And there's Earth influence, represented by blue, and Mars influence, represented by red. Yeah. And the first thing on your turn is you may spend one of your mega credits, which are these little lovely weighty poker chips, to just be like, boop boop, and just switch your influence token to the other side. And that means you can then spend that kind of influence on the next 
step, which is the choice of three actions, which we talked about earlier, casino, mm -hmm. robots, whatever. The first thing you can do is you can hire a person. Here they are in the middle. Mm. If you hire a person, you just take whichever person that you want and you put them in front of you and they'll give you a little bonus. But they'll also increase your influence by that much. So, so this fella, you get six, six more. Boom, 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 boom. Was that six? Yeah. I think I made six booms. You will also then choose whether you want to use that person's immediate effect. So at the top, he will get you one mega credit. Or you can instead give him a little tuck. Flip so. Flip so, tuck so, Flip under your board oh, over here. Fire. Wait, hold on. This is going the wrong way. S Captain. Yeah, no. Abort. Captain, we're going in strong <laughs> and, that and will upside down. <laughs> and that will give you that character's endgame scoring bonus. But you'll need to pay them one money at the end of the game if you want that little credit. That's you're basically saying, <laughs> you're saying, hey, I got a little venture over on this moon. You want to come and be my friend and hey, I'll pay you. Come to Ganymede. <laughs> it's really upsetting me that I can't remember where these uh, other moons are because uh, they they're all moons. They, Jupiter. Jupiter, that's it. Because I, I, I feel just from the expanse yeah. and Destiny 2, I should Yeah, I know, know I know. They're the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Galileo. Yeah, I was waiting for you to do that at some point in this mm, preview. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know I was, but you were, you were correct. There we go. So the second thing you can do, so you can either do that or there's nice, there's only three like things you can do when you turn. They're all very simple. Second thing you can do is take a robot. If you take that robot, you're going to pay that much influence, red for Mars, blue for Earth. Uh -huh. And you take that robot and you're going to assign it to one of the planets that it's shown here. So this brown one, I think, is Callisto, which mm. means you then pop them next to your little Callisto planet. Now, there's a really fun thing with the robots. They're going to do a couple of things. First thing you're going to do is you're going to take the bonus that's on the middle. That one lets you sort of interact with some of the... Uh, so each moon has a sort of different bonus. Each robot has a different bonus. But that bonus in the middle there will let you interact with the folks over here mm. and maybe gain their bonuses, but without actually hiring them onto your planet, which sounds like exploitation. Sounds like freelance. Yeah. <laughs> the second thing you'll do... Oh, sorry, actually, importantly, this is super important. I nearly glossed over it completely. You're going to take that bonus multiplied by the number of robots of that kind that you have anywhere on your oh, board. Oh, okay. So just like Ganymede, which is the first game in this sort of like loose series of space-themed mm. games, you're going to want to compound your bonuses, but you, do you go deep or do you go wide? The second thing you're going to do with any robot is you're going to up your presence on that planet by that many pips. You're going to go up two pips on Callisto. Beep, beep. That will also get you a bunch of bonuses, and each of the moons has its own unique little bonus relating to different areas of the game. Won't go into those, but they're mm. all very, very straightforward. Mm. Now, the third thing you can do is buy a technology. They'll give you a permanent bonus that's pretty fancy. And then the last thing you do on your turn is you will maybe achieve one of these goals, and you can lower the requirements for that goal by spending a different currency called energy, which are these little right. purple I rocks already around. see that that's something you can unlock on Europa. Oh, you can! It's a game. All of the systems interact <laughs> with one another, and you could try and find the best pathway through to mm -hmm. get points. Yeah, pretty much. It's kind of like a, quite a sleek Euro experience. That sounds facetious, but obviously not. No, I love no, games. No. If I didn't love games, then it would be weird that it I was be, doing yeah. this. <laughs> um, let me give you one more thing that's gonna that's gonna get you real excited about playing okay. this game. You'll notice you have one of these little blank cards over here, right? Mm -hmm. It starts next to you. This is a robot that you can build. What I know. So let's say that you're missing your favorite robot. There's not one in the shop. Over the course of the game, you can say, I want to make one of these candy kinds oh, of robots. I see. And what planet do I want it to go to? This one, please. I see. I thought that was really cute. That's very fun. Oh, that was lovely. So if you're missing a sort of cog in your engine, then you can upgrade it. You're not reliant on waiting for the shop to stock your favourite type of robot. Exactly. You can you can go your own way. So you can scrap all this and go to the casino as yeah. rapidly as possible. Exactly. There's a whole bunch of different stuff in this game. Like I could get into more detail, but it's all really straightforward. I read the manual real quick. Maybe that shows. <laughs> uh, but it's nice. It's lovely. I want to give this a. I want to give this a try. It's got some good colours. It's got some real good colours. Um, and it's got some good robots. Yeah. And some lovely planets. And some nice thick poker chips. Mm. And I get to go to a casino once I have uh, got robots to do my job for me. Yeah, exactly. Robo Tom, thank you for doing this video. Deactivate. <laughs> Welcome, Matt to the weirdest preview we've done so far. Tom, have you made a deal with the devil? I've shook in his, shook in his hands. Shook in all of his hands. All of his six hands. Mm. 666 hands on the devil. I found the sixth hand to be rather clammy. Mm. But other than that, I won't hear a word said about them. It is warm down there. Mm. That explains the... the central heating costs <laughs> are through the roof <laughs> down there. Please, I am thrilled to hear more about this weird thing because first of all, let's just reveal the fact that these things exist. Yeah. Each player gets a uh, sort of like 
it's I, I would describe this as being an industrial strength player shield. Yeah, it's like kind of you crazy. You really cannot trust people. You have your own little castle. I think it's referred to in the rule book as you have a castle, but you'll also see you have a rampart <laughs> at the top, which is where you store loads of little bits and bobs. Isn't that it's kind of delightful? I mean, it's amazing. It's a jewel-tiered like, uh, screen reveal. Yeah. You say, I'll lift up my revealable screen, yeah. but never my secret But never screen. the secret stuff going on underneath where you're going to make all your deals with... The Devil. The Devil. Because we should say the name of the game, even where we alluded to it earlier. This is Deal with the Devil from CGE. Mm -hmm. This is a prototype. Mm -hmm. And it is... That won't happen in the final version. <laughs> yeah, the box is going to be reinforced. Um, this is one of the strangest games uh, so far. I'm going to tell you about the sort of simple stuff first, and then we'll get on to the weird stuff. I'll do a little teaser for what that weird stuff is. This is basically a straightforward Euro game. I think it is only for four players. Right. where two players are mortals and they just want to have a good time playing a Euro game. <laughs> One person is a cultist and they love the devil. And the fourth player <laughs> is the devil, which is kind of amazing. You're all building up your own little kingdom at the same time, but the devil starts with a lot of stuff. But they're missing an immortal soul. I'm just enjoying the implication that, like, <laughs> that unless you're a human player, it's, if you want to have a nice time playing a Euro game, no, no, no. -uh. You can't be the devil and have a nice time playing a Euro game. That's hell 101. Well, the, the devil can have a great time once he has enough soul. Because the thing that's interesting about this game is that you'll be sort of playing the same game, but one of you will fundamentally just be sweating the entire time because if you slip up, you'll get revealed as, as being as fundamentally evil. Lucifer himself. Okay. Let me explain the sort of the easy part first, which is what the Euro game sort of thing that you're playing is. We're going to follow a nine step process on various turns. Most of the time it's just a six step process. It's fairly simple. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to produce the resources that are on this central spinny wheel in your section. So at the moment we'll get a marble, a wheat, and a rock. Mm -hmm. That's not a rock, it's a log. That's a log, yeah. You'll get it and you'll put it behind your thing. You're just going to get a little dribble of income every single turn. Then the second thing you're going to do is you're going to get some cards. We start the game with a couple of little building cards. You're going to have a little set of four of them. And you'll also draw an event card every round. And all the events, they have a sort of good side and an evil side. And you'll choose which one to take, and then you'll slot it onto your little rampart at the top. Mm. Um, so you can either interpret any event as you can do the good thing or the bad thing, and that will have consequences that we'll get to later. The third thing you do is where the interesting stuff starts, which is trading. These are your little player cases, and there's an app that will manage whose case belongs to who and what player is what, so that no player knows what everyone else's case contains because it will give away what their role is. What we've got here is the cultist case, and this starts with all of their stuff. You'll see you've got some guessing tokens to guess who the devil is. You've got some money, you've got some marble and some glass, and you've also got two pieces of your soul because you've already sold one of them to the devil at the start of the game. And now you're just going to try and maybe sell a couple. Can I open another one? You can open another one. This is... That looks like a person to me. That's the devil. What? So easily tricked. The devil starts with loads of stuff. Loads of money. But they've got no oh, soul. They've got no soul. They've got I no blooming soul. I didn't notice that. It was so, <laughs> so taken by the money sort of thing that I didn't I notice. The soulnessness. So, and then the other two are going to be mortals. And they start with pretty much nothing, but, but they, they do have a whole got soul. a soul. <laughs> That's so nice. What's going to happen in the trading phase is everyone's, we're going to scan all of the cases with the app and then the app will tell you who you're going to give what case to. But before that happens, you load them up with a deal. Mortals will sort of offer each other stuff and the devil can give them stuff in exchange for pieces of soul. Uh, and that's going to become important later on. You'll do a couple of trades and then we keep going with the rest where we resolve our actions. So it's like we take our stuff out of this, put it behind our board and then we use them for trades. At the start of the game, you're going to have a bunch of stuff in there that's just your starting player resources. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, they're just used for trades. Cool. Just to be like, hey, here, you want to have a little look at this? But you don't, all players sort of put them in the middle, they get shuffled up and then redistributed so no one knows who anyone is at mm -hmm. any given time. Mm -hmm. um, once you're done with all that stuff, you'll then basically program what actions you're going to take for the round. You've got this little tracker up here that says like, you can use some buildings that you've built. You can build more buildings. You can hire some of these guys down here and you can claim these objectives, which are going to get you points at the end of the game. It's all quite straightforward. It's just complicated by all this weird devil stuff. It's, it's just unfortunately going on. a simple Euro game that's got slightly muddled up by the actual devil. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should also explain that throughout the course of the game, you're probably going to want to buy things. You're going to want to buy things with money. Mm. And you can always, don't worry, Matt, you can always go into debt in this game. And debt in this game is absolutely brutal. You'll see over here that you've got this little debt tracker mm -hmm. that goes from one to 10. Every time you borrow money, you'll tick it up. But what, there's something kind of nuts that's going to happen where you'll lose points at the end of the game and you'll also get sort of bad blasphemer 
tokens, which will explain what they do in a little bit. But at the end of every round, you move this little thing round a number of times based on how high up your debt is. So let's say we're all the way up here on six. You'd move this round six, six times. times, and every time it passes this, your debt increases. And if it keeps <clears throat> nudging against the top, you're going to become really blasphemous. And that'll have the Inquisitors knocking at your door. But we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> this is a silly game. Yeah, yeah. At the end of each round, the various buildings that you build are going to give you either positive reputation or negative reputation, which you can see tracked over on this board over here. At the end of each round, the player who has the best reputation is going to become more virtuous, mm -hmm. and the people who have bad reputation will become even more blasphemous. Why is that important? Because on some rounds, as you can see by this little thing, doo -doo -doo -doo, we will have a witch trial. Oh. And then on this round, we'll have a witch trial and an inquisition. Right. And this is where these characters over here... Which that's I'll a, just, that's a busy week. I know, absolutely. I'll bring these... Oh, no, I you're getting a takeaway on Saturday night after that. <laughs> after the feet up. <laughs> well, these, they will... Like, there's two of them start the game asleep, which is great. Like, well, you might not be putting your feet up <laughs> ever again. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work being an Inquisitor. Basically, these little guys are going to dock everyone points based on how evil you are. Right. But you can also bribe them in between rounds you can pay a certain amount of money to like pay off these guys these systems interact with the soul mechanics <coughs> bless you there's a lot development knows if you have three pieces of soul you're basically fine doesn't matter because the inquisitors you have to sort of show them a little bit of soul to make sure that they don't come down on you but if you don't have enough requisite soul they'll be real mad but you right. could not have enough soul either if you're the devil because you started with none or if you're a human that's traded away a little bit of soul it's kind of like, risk-reward mechanic. So you kind of need to shed a sliver of soul. Just a little bit like, look, I am still at least partially human. Solely. Yeah, exactly. Um, you also have a whole system where um, there's going to be voting between all of the players to try and guess who the devil is around the table. And that player then has to reveal that they have three pieces of soul or they have to be like, you got me, I'm the devil. The thing that's fun is you think that would be like an instant loss for the devil. It isn't. They just lose a bunch of reputation. Right. Because the thing that matters in this game ultimately, like, the positives of gaining lots of reputation and being really like virtuous is just that you get to like avoid inquisition now and again. And the difficulty of being really, really bad is you lose points, but it doesn't have anything to do with like, you can lose, you can have no soul at the end of the game. You can still be quite successful. I mean, yeah, exactly. And still be making it in the world of deal with the devil. Really bizarre game. Fascinating. I'm really excited to, to play this one yeah. because it just seems bonkers. Absolutely fascinating. Classic CG. Thank you Tom for uh, blessing my sneezes. This is Sabika, a game about building the Alhambra. This is a giant palace, fortress, castle thing that's filled with poems carved into the walls and beautiful art and mosaics and other types of work. But like the game really wanted to highlight that it is full of poetry. It is the longest standing piece of literature in the world, maybe. In Sabika, you are aiming to fulfil the Sultan's wishes and impress him, gaining prestige points for all of the building, poetry and trading that you can do in this game. The rondel in the middle of the board really genuinely is quite massive. This giant rondel is covered in workers, although not at the beginning, actually they start in your workshop having a bit of a nap. You can send them back there for a nap, I'm not sure how often you'll want to do that. So at the beginning of the game, you can put them on any space in their perspective thing, but most of the time you're going to be going around this rondel one or two spaces or further if you can afford to pay for it. Now, this is actually three rings of actions and essentially these four workers that you've got are split into three different types. The master craftsman go around the outside and they do all of your architecture, the big bits of trading, claiming the resources that you'll need to do all of the building. The merchants are on the middle ring. They'll be trading and exporting to foreign countries. There's a whole map down the bottom and an absolutely absurd number of ships. Finally, in the middle, the poets writing you poems. Uh, this is one of the distinctive things about the Alhambra is that the walls have poetry carved into them. So it's probably like the biggest, most expensive poetry book of all time. Although considering most of the poetry books I've ever read have been like uh, very cheap home printed zines. The competition isn't great. No, no, that's not fair. Like, honestly, it's amazing. Like, this is literally a work of literature that is also a palace, which is also a fort. And that's what this game 
wants to describe you building. So yeah, your workers of all three different points follow the same approximate rules. You can move them one or two spaces around and then they have a lie down and take an action. Now, if you go to a place that has other people's workers on, you will have to pay money and you can't have both of your master craftsmen on the same spot. So there's a lot of jockeying for position on these three tracks and the fact that there's three of them means you've got to decide which one you're going to prioritize first and maybe an early move will block other people but maybe it won't. It's an interesting blend of rundle stuff and worker placement. As you can see this board is absolutely laden with different types of resources and pieces and cards and tiles. Uh, we have major constructions. This is the big stuff. It's definitely the thrust of the game and a big part of where your points will come from. We have minor constructions down here a little ring of cards where you'll actually be playing a kind of dominoes game trying to put two cards together and make the things line up which gives you an extra bonus obviously you can just build something and not get a bonus that's not obvious rules of board games are never obvious we've got the poems these cards are poems which will either give you a permanent ongoing bonus or an immediate treat of some kind those are actually two different types of poem that the cost will rise for separately i kind of feel like there's something there in about like kind of worthy literature versus like slam poetry but i don't want to be harsh about slam poetry because Actually, some of it's quite good and worthier than a lot of worthy literature. But I'm getting sidetracked again. Poems are cards with these bonuses on and they're another big source of points. Something that you want to be pushing for. At the bottom of the board, there's this map of all of the different places you can export goods for. As you can imagine, there's a bit of racing to get to the new places and sell off the best stuff. Also, I've got, I've got to go back to the rundle because I've only described the main actions and not the secondary actions, which are these little things that run in between the rundles. What's going on there? Well, if you activate one of the spaces next to them, you might be able to grab this little treat. Um, now, these round counters are the raw materials that can be upgraded into fancy goods. Interestingly here, there is a thing where when you get one of your workers to here, you get one of these goods, you put it in your workshop. But if you want to upgrade it, you want to land on a space that has that resource again. Because you either take the resource or you use it to upgrade a good you've already got. You can turn a bit of linen into a coat. I've heard of that happening. I've heard that that's a possibility. And so those are the raw materials and certain bits of the board will want those goods like particularly for trading and exporting and for some of the bonuses that are around you want those goods but the building materials are an entirely separate type of resource gypsum wood marble and glazed ceramics you'll need those for your actual building pretty much everything needs a bit of gypsum it's the base that was that was binding the bricks together and making all of the stuff but because the poems are actually carved into the walls. You'll be needing this stuff just to do poetry. Paper isn't good enough here. We want to make poems that will last for centuries. As you can see, there's quite a lot of moving parts here. There's these three different workers, big rundle of action, secondary actions that may or may not get triggered on there, different prices depending on which angle you're approaching the secondaries from, all of the little bonuses down here, unique powers from the poems, a domino game of minor constructions, and actually trying to impress the Sultan by building the right big things. This takes place over five rounds, five eras of constantly moving stuff around, putting your workers out, moving them around the rundle and seeing what happens next. There's a lot of planning to do here. There's a lot of stuff out in the open. There's an advanced mode that adds in some events and a few other little wrinkles. And there's a solo mode that comes with its own decks of cards and instructions. If you're playing with less players, you end up with more pieces on the rundle with the Sultan's workers taking the place of some of the other players in terms of blocking you and taking up certain slots or making them more expensive. It feels like there really is quite a lot of different economies to try and work with and play with here and I'm a bit overwhelmed just trying to describe it but also there's some interesting ideas in there. So that is Sabika. It is a lot of pieces on a very big board, an enormous rundle, loads of cards and moving parts and quite a lot of things to think about. It's probably the prettiest game with this many different shades of beige that I've seen for quite a long time. And that is Sabika. If you want to build your Alhambra, 
get some friends together and do it. Hello and welcome to Airmail. This is a Shucks preview of this game and we're looking at the Canada board. I have not got enough time to explain this whole game to you. So we're going to just do a little whistle stop tour of some of the things I think are cool about Canada. No, about Airmail. In this game you are rival companies bidding for government subsidies to try and make the biggest income by the end of the game. There are deals you can make with the government, special requests they've made for you that will earn money for everyone at the table, but one person gets to decide who triggers them. You are mostly doing route building. This is almost a train game but with planes. You're making these routes and then trying to pick up items that you deliver from one place to another, possibly getting a little treat along the way. Now, if you're using all of your own planes, that's fine, that's free. If you're using other people's planes, you've got to pay them income. They will gain something. So you can put little bottlenecks in here that mean that people will have to be using your planes to do what they want to do. But can you predict what people want to do? I don't know. There's a couple of different ways you get points. Just doing a trip from one state to another or division, because they're not actually lining up with the states completely, you will get points depending on how far away it is. If you can get from one division to the other side of the board, that's loads of points, but you've got to get your tech up first. The more technology you have, the further you can fly and the more rewards you get when you deliver. There's also special deliveries. These want to go to very specific places. You'll start off the game with some of them and you'll be able to get more as you go on. Now, how does this all actually play out? Well, on your turn, you have to do one of two things. The first one is the more complicated one and the one that involves the most steps. You will play a card from your hand. Now, these are effectively played around the board like dominoes. You can add to either end of the run, starting at the flag. But when you do, you've got to follow domino rules and match with what's already there. Now, as you can see here, we've mixed up the prairie division which means that we get to take actions associated with this yellow prairie division. You have three actions to spend when you do this and you get to spend them on any number of placing of new routes, putting planes onto the board, but the rest of the actions can only be done once each. These are delivering packages, upping your tech, or taking more new cards, more of these permit cards, to take the actions that you want on later turns. The other action you can do actually uses the cards that you've already placed. You will have a single plane that is flying along the dominoes onto these bonus spaces, which will let you place new routes, get up special deliveries, pick up cards and the things that you need to do to complete the game. Now, as you lay these domino permit cards on the board, you will find that eventually you will cover up one of these postal service decree cards. Now these cards are what the government has told you the postal service needs to be doing. This applies to everybody, but it happens at the end of the turn of the person who goes over that card. This means if you open one of these up, you're making it easier for you to have a bit more control over how many points you're gonna get out of that card. And that is airmail. It's straightforward route building, a little bit of mean stealing off other people and a surprising addition of dominoes around the outside. Round the outside, round the outside. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you in Vancouver. Bye.